You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Monday, 21st of October, 2013. Knocked unconscious, 10 stitches and police encourage her to accept £150 compensation so they don't have to pursue charges. Britain has paid out millions to criminals in human rights cases. Greek government targets Golden Dawn state funding. Greece, immigrants' interest in repatriations growing fast. Norway's new child and equality minister's interviews make trouble. 7 out of 10 Italians fear losing job. Pakistan, school textbooks teach it's okay to kill Christians. Religious levy costs Queensland's abattoirs thousands each month. Moscow Muslims complain of suppression. Thought for the day, ageism or genocide for the elderly. And finally, two for one. If Tesco's can do it, so can we. Before the news, I'd like to thank all the wonderful and informative comments that come in. I always read them. I don't reply because comments are yours think space, not mine. I've already done my bit. A word to Kugel, bless him or her, I do try to give good news, which is why I do the finally bit after the thoughts, but unfortunately good news is not often newsworthy or applicable to our nationalist stance. Imagine what it entails to set up and compile all the news three times a week. It's a wonder we aren't all on antidepressants. But there are several good news items today, but they are European and world not UK. Sorry. UK news. Knocked unconscious, 10 stitches, and police encourage her to accept £150 compensation so they don't have to pursue charges. A mother who was battered unconscious by a woman in an unprovoked attack was offered £150 by police to drop the charges so they could avoid filling out paperwork. Hayley Clayton, 32, spent a night in hospital and needed 10 stitches after she was punched in the head and knocked out during a night out in Spalding, Lincolnshire. She received a call from police three weeks later saying they believed they knew who her attacker was and were making an arrest. The mother of one from nearby Malton Sea's End then got another call the next day telling her they had a Lithuanian woman in custody and she had admitted the assault. But she was disgusted when officers said she would not be prosecuted because it was a waste of taxpayers' money. World to date states, you bet they'd have found the money if this lady had been black and the immigrant had been white. Britain has paid out millions to criminals in human rights cases. Britain has lost 202 cases in the European Court of Human Rights, including to murderers, terrorists, paedophiles and rapists, resulting in payouts of 4.5%. Four million pounds it has emerged. The taxpayer funded compensation awarded by Strasbourg judges since nineteen ninety eight averages at around twenty two thousand pounds a head, and recipients have included British double agent George Blake and extremist cleric Abu Hamza. The figures released by the House of Commons and seen by the Daily Mail have increased pressure on the government to pull out of the European Convention in order to reform human rights law. World Date says, in the words of Victor Meldrew, I simply don't believe it. European News. Greek government targets Golden Dawn state funding. Greece on Thursday backed a proposal that would suspend state funding of Golden Dawn Party, reports Kathy Marini. The proposal found broad support among the coalition and opposition parties, although leftist groups voiced concerns others could be targeted if Golden Dawn is not explicitly mentioned in the bill. Greece, immigrants' interest in repatriation growing fast. Almost 2,000 migrants in Greece have applied for voluntary repatriation since the beginning of July, largely due to joblessness. Since the summer, 832 Pakistanis, 361 Bangladeshis and 142 Georgians have been amongst those who have chosen to return home. The people who asked to leave Greece face huge problems, said Daniel Estras, head of IOM in Greece. Nine in ten are homeless and have to look for food every day. They have realised they are in a tragic situation, a dead end. World at eight. Or, as I have been saying for the last few years, make life difficult, not easy for immigrants, and they won't want to travel thousands of miles to come here.
Norway's new child and equality minister's interviews make trouble. Newly appointed child and equality minister Solvig Horn's previous statements about immigrants, gay and rape victims, stir up a new political polemic in the country. Norwegian newspapers bring back the Progress Party, FRP deputy, and the new child and equality minister Solvig Horn's previous statements. According to VG, Horn said that the girls are responsible for the situation they put themselves in. When she was asked about the rape of women in an interview with NRK in 2011, in an interview with Stavanger Aftenblad three years ago, she said rapes in Stavanger is a consequence of the government's immigration policy. She had further suggested that Jens Stoltenberg and his people in the cabinet bring men from medieval cultures to Norway, which allegedly results in the raping of Norwegian women. World at Eight comments. She ain't wrong, is she? Seven out of ten Italians fear losing jobs. Seven out of ten people in recession hit Italy fear losing their jobs. 53% are afraid they won't be able to support their family and 16% admitted they personally knew somebody who had stolen food out of need, according to a survey carried out by Farmers Association, Goldoretti and Polling Institute IX released on Friday. The survey on the perception of the crisis and made in Italy presented at a forum on agriculture and nutrition in the northern Italian town of Sanobio on Lake Como also found that 22% of Italian families said they would be in dire financial straits this fall. And while 42% of Italians had no financial concerns, almost half of those polled, 45%, just about make it to the end of the month once all bills are paid and cannot afford any extras while another 2 million families, roughly 10%, live in poverty, the study said. World News Pakistan. School textbooks teach it's okay to kill Christians. The textbooks of Pakistani schools pose the killing of Christians as a goal to be sought that would help the same members of the minority to seek martyrdom for the faith. This is shown by a report published in late September by the Middle East Media Research. According to research, the texts are common in most public primary schools and even Pakistani Christians and members of other minorities are forced to read and study them. The authors of the books, led by the religious leaders, have changed the meaning of the term minority, which is now perceived with negative meaning. Religious levy costs Queensland abattoirs thousands each month. Queensland abattoirs are being slugged thousands of dollars a month through a religious levy on meat exports so powerful Muslim clerics in Jakarta can raise money for Islamic schools and mosques. The halal certification fees can cost some meat processors up to $27,000 a month. The Indonesian Council of Ulama, the top Islamic body which orders fatwa religious rulings, has even banned a Brisbane business from operating because it was not charging Queensland abattoirs enough to give the religious tick-off to export meat. The scandal has stopped most of Queensland's halal meat exports to Indonesia as angry abattoir operators boycott the more expensive halal certifiers endorsed by the MUI. World at Eight So much for Australia and New Zealand's lamb industry. I always thought they were British colonies funded on Western culture and Christianity. What place does halal butchery have down under? Money is what it is and the love of money that these Muslims count on. Let them kill their own animals in their own countries. These Aussies and others should have more guts and principles. They will probably run to do business with China, who seem incapable of raising decent cattle or sheep themselves. But at least they aren't halal-ridden. <laughs> Moscow Muslims complain of suppression. While the Russian Orthodox Church was building 200 new churches around Moscow, new mosque projects never win building permits. Every Aid or Ramadan, the growing Muslim community in Moscow recalls a never-ending problem of mosque shortage, being forced to pray in the streets under rain or even snow. Russian Muslim activist Gaida Dzemel accused the Kremlin of blocking new mosques in Russia's capital. Last March, the mayor of Moscow has warned that no permission would be granted building new mosques in the metropolitan city. Vowing that no new mosques will be built in Moscow, Sergei Sobyanyan has attacked economic immigrants for irritating Muscovites with their different language and manners. Opposition to the building of mosques is not new in Moscow. Last December, government plans to build six new mosques in the Russian capital sparked a controversy in the country, with opponents calling for a public referendum on the building of mosques in Moscow. In 2012, hundreds of residents of Moscow's neighbourhood of Mitino staged a protest against the building of an Islamic cultural centre in their far-flung district. 
Three years ago, cinema news in the Tetstil Shiki area in the city's eastern part saw residents up in arms against building a mosque on the park. World at eight. Quite right, too. Once you make the mistake of giving an inch with one mosque, you might as well shut up the Christian shop and country, as we have done. Thought for the day. Ageism or genocide for the elderly? Are our elderly, and by that I mean our elderly, not so-called British non-English elderly, under threat? Yes, they are, and it is increasing. They are being persecuted not only in their homes by governments and establishment, but by the society in which they have not only grown old in, but have paid their way into for many years. We have to realise that the British ethos is not to take care of our old folk, and in fact we spend much more government money taking care of our disabled and mentally challenged than we do our parents or grandparents, and indeed older folk are encouraged in some ways to be more unwell to get more benefits, and this the pharmaceutical companies just love. The governments love us because they can blame us for the NHS shortfalls in staff, money and time, and indeed are encouraging us at every available opportunity to buy our own coffins and go abroad to die with dignity. You cannot open a paper today without some headline screaming for dignity for the elderly with one page, whilst exhorting our older people to cash in their houses or pay into this company for your relatives after your death or pay for your own funeral or glory of glories, have an Alzheimer's test to see whether in a few short years you'll be reduced to a gibbering idiot and will be a burden on the NHS or worse still, what relatives you have left who don't ignore you. I don't want to have to sell my house if I go barmy to have to pay for so-called third-rate care handed out in a third-rate home by third-world people. Not because I want to leave it necessarily to my children, but because it is mine. I have paid into the UK tax system since I was 17 years old, with precious few breaks. So I view every benefit I get, I've earned. Much more so than the immigrants who have ended up on our shores, and in our benefit and NHS systems. The medical profession have added yet another revolting scenario to the laughable care and treatment of us oldies, namely end-of-life advanced care planning claim form, which is something the average immigrant should have immediately he comes into the country for at least 24 hours until his deportation, but not me. Your GP is going to be paid a £50 bonus per patient he or she puts on this death list. So when in fact the £50 should be given to the patient to indulge a fish and chip supper on Brighton or Blackpool seafront for their end of days. The medical profession has at least stopped short of mercy killings, mainly because they're only merciful to the progeny of Mar or Pa, who they resent either having to look after not look after, or using what money they have to be looked after, and thus depriving little Janet or Bob of the shekels they think they deserve for being born. The silver vote, which I have renamed the platinum vote, as platinum is more valuable, is very important to us as a party. We don't see them as dragging society down, but enhancing it with valuable standards of old, and far from being on the scrap heap after 50, most of our best activists are over that age, and although heading in the wrong direction for today's society, provide valuable information and advice for our party. So we have a plethora of the pre-baby boomers and baby boomers ostensibly living off the fat of the land. Because we are obviously past breeding status, we are victimised because of it, when in fact the establishment should be blaming the younger, more selfish generations, who would rather not have children or keep aborting them for the shortfall in English birth rates. But of course, if our young were producing children, this would be one less reason for importing so many foreigners. It is the Western youth who should be penalised for not marrying and not breeding from the right source. It's their fault we have a dwindling baby population of our own tribes, not us. We did our bit in producing at least three generations of children. It is the present and previous generations, the children of the baby boomers who can and should be blamed, named and shamed. Because thanks to them, when we baby boomers finally desert this mortal coil, whether by fair means or foul, where are the English children to take over? We have local councils now who are doing what they can do best. No, not preventing mosques taking over churches or immigrant families taking over the housing lists, but prying into the older generation's business and making sure they don't put their house in their children's names to avoid having to sell it to pay for council care in the future.
This is a disgusting thing, and where the EU could be useful, but is probably behind it, and that is human rights. If you've finally got a fully paid up house and you're over 50, then in my personal view, and indeed the British National Party's view, you can do what you like with it. And indeed, if certifiably nuts, you would have every excuse to do just that. Anything. Make a bonfire out of it. Turn it into a squat for depressed squaddies. Have a pig farm. Give it to your kids or grandchildren. Anything to make sure the state has to fork out for you to have your ass wiped for the last remaining years of your life. So we're sitting in our houses we've saved for, bought and looked after for many years, and many of our children and grandchildren have been educated in the me ethos and without having previous generations to respect and looked after, the last thing on most of our descendants' minds is visiting us, let alone actually caring what happens behind closed doors. I remember my mother, bless her, now departed, and she always stated she didn't want to be a nuisance. And this is how, especially since the end of World War I, that the old are regarded in this country. With the end of the Great War, the social system in England was broken, and not in a good way. The good old backbone of England, the true working class, were gone, and they had always looked after their old in their homes, batty or not. The very wealthy nobility and landed families had also looked after their own elderly, with a rather fond affection for the mentally challenged ones, labelling them eccentric, but allowing them free reign around their grounds, because it was all down to blood and inheritance. The burgeoning middle class, which was mainly working class and less than noble families, aspired to this new generation of trade and shopkeepers. But with that came a studied ignorance of their old, and a wish not only to never look old, but to push as far away as possible the relics of their childhoods, whether happy, unhappy, awful, whatever. In our culture, in our schools or in our families, very few mention their old, and few even see them. Although there was very little family for me growing up, my stepfather's family were very good to me, and we always had family Christmases. And I remember my step-grandmother. She always wore black since the Queen died, and was rigidly upright in place in the drawing room all the time, and I used to be allowed to sit next to her. She was never excluded, and never ignored. Now, although I rant on about the Muslims and South Asian immigrants, there's one thing to admire about them, and I've always said it, their attitude to family and their elderly relations. The Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, the Nepalese, the Thais, the Filipinos and all the rest look after their own, which is just as well as we have a growing number of them in the UK as well, and a country which cannot look after its own old shouldn't have to look after newcomers elderly. Jeremy Hunt, Health Secretary, has said that grandparents are Britain's shame, and they are. His figure of over a million souls is way under, and the unofficial figure is much, much higher. His wife is Chinese, and both they and the Japanese do look after their older generations. However, even as Mr Hunt says, now that the Chinese are officially growing a new middle class themselves, they're finding the standards of the greedy, selfish European strata of middlemen having an effect on their society and its treatment of their old. But I'm sorry that the British culture has never had the time for anyone over the hill, and the greatest insult you can give a person is old as well as fat. And although ageism, like fatism, is not supposed to be encouraged, it really is, isn't it? Looking on the bright side, we do have a growing business for strangers in owning care homes, old people's homes, EMI units, which is elderly mentally infirm units, homes for dementia and homes for the permanently unwanted and bewildered, most of whom are owned by Southeast Asians and, of course, staffed by the same, or the Eastern Europeans, all going great guns on the bodies of our old people and the British dislike of caring for their own flesh and blood. Ageism in the workplace, what a laugh. Today the Mail gave a full-page spread to a woman of just over 50, made redundant. Pardon me for laughing. What is more important is the white male of 50 being made redundant and never working again. That's 15 years till retirement, wasted or pushing trolleys. Now that is a waste of manpower in this world today. Not encouraging women to have careers might well make them do something a man cannot do. Produce children. I can understand men wanting to see dolly birds on the TV rather than an old bird. That's a man's right. Trying to sue because you've grown older is a thankless and unforgiving task. But one only has to see John McCreerick, 73, who thinks he was debunked because he was old. 
No, it was because he was awful to watch and always had been, even when younger. Old age doesn't necessarily bring wisdom, but it should bring the means to see yourself clearly as others see you. Let the Asian care home owners contribute to the UK elderly in response to Alan's Milburn and his particular bit of nastiness in telling us pensioners we should take some of the burden of the government cuts and national debt and national debt. Why? We didn't do it. It was your generation, Milburn and Younger, that have made all the trouble in the banking and mortgage world and are currently cocking up the EU as well. Not us. We weren't allowed anywhere near anything as important as that. We're too old. Remember? And finally, two for the price of one. If Tesco can, we can. A six-foot alligator caused panic when he waddled up to the front doors of a Walmart in Apopka, Florida. The stray reptile caused the automatic doors to open and close repeatedly as it walked past them until employees locked them and called the police. Police officers tried to draw the beast from the shop front while shoppers snapped photos on their mobile phones. The alligator finally wandered off and disappeared into woods behind Walmart. This presenter says, I watched the video and what a handsome young chappy he was. He was just playing games, watching the doors go back and forth, bless him. It might be news for humans, but alligators owned Florida before humans were even thought of. And now a joke. During a lady's medical examination, the doctor says, Your heart, lungs, pulse and blood pressure are all fine. Now let me see the bit that gets you ladies into all kinds of trouble. The lady starts taking off her underwear, but is interrupted by the doctor. No, 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 don't remove your clothes, just stick out your tongue. You've been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart and I wish you all a very good night. <laughs>